Good afternoon, everybody. We are back for a PCA Live Government Affairs update. Uh, traditionally, it's August recess, although it did not feel like a recess whatsoever. A lot of activities going on both uh, at the state and federal levels. Uh, Glenn Loop is joining me to talk all things states, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the activities going on at the federal level first. Uh, and then we'll kind of close off with some general updates. Um, we mentioned before a lot of emphasis in the past few months and, and also uh, this month has been on tax increases, federal tax increases. Uh, a couple months back, if you recall, we issued an action alert uh, about a, a bill that was introduced by Senator Durbin and Representative Christian Morthy in the House. Uh, this would raise taxes on premium cigars a, a thousand percent and uh, pipe tobacco 1600 um, percent. We have had a series of meetings, uh, about 20 uh, over the course of August, educating folks about premium cigars and talking about how detrimental this federal tax increase would be, that it really is a prohibitionist policy. Uh, we've circulated talking points arguing uh, against the tax increase to staff at all levels. And um, that message is, is resonating. Um, there are, were discussions uh, about the infrastructure plan as well as the budget during the budget reconciliation process about potentially including some of these uh, tax increases. We feel that we're in the best position that we've been in um, over the, the past two months. Uh, but we are not stepping off the gas pedal at all, and we'll continue to message that moving forward. We know that there's been a few uh, retailers that have invited members of Congress uh, to the locations, and we appreciate those that uh, took part. We know in Ohio uh, that took place, and that's important to give that sensory firsthand experience of what all you deal with on a daily basis and the regulations and legislation that can be positive as well as negative to doing business. Um, another few projects that uh, we're collectively working on in government affairs um, produced a new white paper on the current state of the regulatory process. Some of the conversations that we've had uh, over the past few years with the White House under the Trump administration, as well as the Biden administration about the regulation of premium cigars. Um, this white paint paper is kind of a good synopsis of where things have gone over the, the past few years and where they are today. And it's something that we will be messaging to members of Congress, both allies and uh, potential new allies as we continue to cultivate those relationships. And this will be the underpinnings of a new project uh, that Glenn, myself, and uh, Ryan Parada, who's been doing research with us uh, for the past few months, we're gonna be working on uh, as, as we, you know, towards the end of this year, hoping to release this sometime in, in December, but looking at the historic um, precedent of Reg, uh, legislation and regulation of premium cigars. And we plan on releasing as an association an ebook on that, um, that of course is, is geared towards policymakers, but it will also give a better understanding for our membership um, and, uh, you know, folks that are interested in premium cigars. So expect that to, to come up. Um, in addition to that, we are hosting our first congressional reception of uh, 2021. Uh, we did not have any last year due to the pandemic. Uh, so we're excited to host folks here at the office in Washington, DC. Of course, a, a limited number of people on September 15th. Uh, some <coughs> of the industry partners will also be joining us uh, for that event as we enjoy premium cigars and talk about the policy matters moving forward. Um, I know that we're, and it, it seems crazy to think, but we're starting to get to that pre-file uh, period of time in the year. Um, so I know that Glenn has a lot of state activities to talk about and things that we'll be gearing up towards 
um, for the rest of this year and into 2022, uh, which will be very active on the state fronts, um, you know, state-wise, when, uh, of, of course, is your point of contact, but I will be assisting in that uh, area as well in a few select states. And we've had, you know, some victories this year, uh, some lessons learned as we move forward um, and, and discuss policy matters at both the state and local levels. Uh, but Glenn, you want to give us kind of a, an update on where things stand and where things are headed? Well, thanks, Josh. I appreciate that. And, you know, even though state legislatures for the most part in the country are adjourned for the year, there's still some lingering issues, if you will, uh, that we're keeping a close eye on and that we want to encourage consumers and retailers alike to utilize our cigaraction.org, even at this late stage in the state legislative season. And with that, we know that the 50 cent tax cap measure will be coming back up in Michigan uh, when they reconvene for a fall session. And at least that's the word right now. Uh, as we all know, at least within the industry, uh, Michigan has just been at the forefront of utilizing, advocating for, and demonstrating, and that's the most important part, I believe, demonstrating that a 50 cent tax cap is a lifesaver for the small community retail tobacconists. Uh, especially when they have to compete against lower cost alternatives or higher taxes in other states. Uh, when a state is tempted to raise its OTP level, that 50 cent tax cap serves as a great buffer to uh, really encourage, if you will, the consumer to, to support and shop with their local brick and mortar community tobacconist. So we want that sunset cause to disappear in Michigan. We want it to be institutionalized, if you will. Uh, and, and that should be coming back up uh, upon a reconvening this year. Also, the cigar bar bill and the 50 cent tax cap bill are still alive in the state of New York. Um, there's a rumor that New York's in a state of political turmoil. I don't know if there's any truth to it, but there's it's it's I hear it's on the Internet. But uh, nonetheless, there's some great allies of this industry in the New York legislature. And the New York Tobacconists Association have built a great bipartisan coalition uh, with, with lead sponsor, uh, the chairman, the chairwoman of the Senate Labor Committee, sponsoring both the tax cap bill and the, uh, and the cigar bar bill, cigar lounge bar bill in the state of New York in the assembly in Albany. Uh, even if, and that's the great long game vision of the board and the New York Tobacco Association, they've got that long game vision. And I would encourage retailers across the country to adopt that. That means even if they're not successful at getting this legislation through this specific session in this, year, in the, this calendar year, they're completely resolved to support it and, and retain their professional advocacy support in Albany to have that legislation reintroduced in January in Albany and it's great model legislation. And it, let's face it, if it gets through the New York legislature, it can happen anywhere. Um, and there's just some great institutional community tobacconists throughout that state that are creating a, a role model for others. Also, we know that what is currently called SB 131, which would reduce the OTP tax level in Delaware from 30% to 15%, will be rolled over into the 22 legislative session. That means it's still alive. And it's got wonderful bipartisan support. Uh, we testified as did consumers and retailers throughout Delaware. It's just good to know that that legislation that we can count on it coming back in a reintroduced fashion uh, when that legislature reconvenes in January. Uh, I wanna commend members of the city council of Elkhart, Indiana. And those of you who haven't heard of Elkhart, I had not either. But it's marvelous that they, too, following the lead of, of, of Louisville, Kentucky and uh, Augusta, Georgia, in introducing a cigar bar exemption bill. And just this morning, I forwarded it out to the sponsoring councilman, uh, our, our policy piece that's at CigarAction.org, that helps to refute, if you will, the public health outcry that comes when these cigar bar exemption bills ordinances are introduced. Uh, you know, as we noted in previous broadcasts, it uh, passed in Augusta, Georgia. It was a very, very narrow defeat in Louisville, Kentucky, but a great outstanding effort that I'll, that I've been assured will come back. And now we have a, a community in Indiana wanting the same. 
you know, Indiana's really def- started to create a, what I would call a cigar culture uh, with with uh, Mickey Blaine's and Burn and Blend all be concentra- all concentrated in the Indianapolis area. You could spend a whole weekend in Indianapolis just enjoying the cigar culture of, of Indianapolis through three great uh, lounges that are among the best in the country. You know, and think about the money that Rocky Patel has invested in creating Burn in Pittsburgh and Atlanta. Uh, what Blend has done in Nashville and, and Houston. What Casa de Monte Cristo has done in communities throughout the country. We're proving, this industry is proving the role that this industry plays in the culture of cigars and how different it is from other tobacco products and helping communities to make that case. And when I say communities, I'm not talking about the cigar community. These elected officials did this on their own. It's a recognition by local elected officials about the role that these types of lounges play in the small business community in their respective states and regions. So with that, we just want to encourage that that trend and now that we've got three like this in a very short period of time, I'll call it a trend. I'll, I'll close on this. I want to go through some punch lists that I am going to preach from now until January about what we need from, from the retail and consumer community to do now, right now, in preparation for the 2022 legislative season. One, start outreach to your legislators right now. If you don't know them, get to know them. Invite them to your store. Even if you don't think there's going to be issues, make sure they know who you are and what's important to you. Two, post cigaraction.org on every website for every cigar shop in America. It's our tool to reach the consumer, to let them know of the policy measures that impact their enjoyment of premium handmade cigars. Three, engage with your state association. Uh, We've got to create this critical mass of state associations. We've got about half the country organized. We're gonna be working on five or six states here in the next several weeks. We've already started this process, uh, having a great dialogue with our friends in Kentucky. And we're gonna be working to strengthen uh, and rehabilitate and uh, start from the ground up in some cases with associations in, in at least a half a dozen states over the next couple of months in preparation for the next state legislative season. And Four, I want you to keep a particular eye out on the, t- the types of legislation that the cigar industry can get caught up in. Local control. We were fortunate that this year bills of that nature went that would have granted tax independent taxing and regulatory power to local governments uh, from the states in Oregon, Kentucky, Tennessee, New Mexico, and Missouri. That type of legislation can certainly come back and be reintroduced. Tax legislation and making sure that we don't get swept up in vape and e-cigarette legislation because they're in that OTP category. Making sure that premium handmade cigars are protected and exempt and not subject to that legislation where we know that's the target. We just went through a a hearing that uh, our friends at Smoker Friendly in Colorado alerted us to in the city of Denver on a flavored tobacco ban. Well, it was painfully obvious. The target was vape but too easy to sweep up pipe tobacco and other products in that when we know that we're not the target. So keeping an eye out for that type of legislation and ordinances at state and local level is critical as well. So I know that's a mouthful, but uh, and I'd be glad to, people can reach me at uh, glenn at premiumcigars.org if you have any questions or ways that we can be of assistance. And and with that, we'll be keeping an eye out on legislation that's pre-filed from now until the end of this calendar year that'll be confronting us good, bad, or indifferent in January. But the preparation, again, starts now. Thanks, Josh. Absolutely, Glenn. And uh, just to uh, put a finer point on a few things that you said, you know, going into next year and the state legislative sessions, you know, we want to be on the offensive and get things done, not just be reactive uh, in a lot of ways. So, you know, we have model cigar bar legislation. So if your community um, is considering it and you have a favorable elected official or a contact, um, you know, reach out to Glenn, work with me, and um, we'll try and get things introduced elsewhere. I think that the positive uh, inroads that were made in Augusta um, and the successful passage of it, that should be replicated elsewhere. Let's establish more venues that permit 
the enjoyment of premium cigars, an adult luxury product, as well as, as uh, cocktails and, 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 and other things. They become destinations. They become uh, a tourist draw for local communities. And we have evidence and, and um, specific ordinance and legislative text that can be replicated elsewhere. So that, that is something that I think would be uh, great if we were able to get a half dozen uh, cities to adopt uh, model cigar bar legislation next year. Um, also, I do want to point out a, a two other things as we close. Uh, the National Academies of Sciences is still undergoing their research effort on the health effects and usage of premium cigars. They have a next, their next meeting is actually tomorrow. Um, they set up different working groups and uh, they are convening tomorrow in a closed session. Um, again, their research proposal or their research findings are supposed to be released in 2022. Uh, we'll keep people apprised on, on the findings and we are still interacting with that group to make sure that um, the accurate information from the industry, from the association, and from our members is clearly heard. Um, also, I got a, a question here from Jeff about the uh, uh, the Durban bill. I mentioned that uh, at, at the start a little bit. Um, the Durban bill itself, you know, there are two forms, the Mamas Act, which does maternal health and increases taxes on tobacco products as a pay for. Then there is the Tax uh, Parity and Equity Act, which that also increases taxes. Similar language. Um, there are, you know, House and Senate counterpart bills in that. We don't expect these to be passed as standalone legislation. However, our biggest concern is that they get. I mentioned the infrastructure bill at the onset. They were not included in the infrastructure bill. Um, and the budget discussions during reconciliation, that is concerned. We've done 20 meetings um, in August about this in particular with Senate allies and House allies, as well as offices that we traditionally would not have met with uh, to make sure that they understand uh, the magnitude and the adverse effects of this bill. So we'll continue to do that. Um, one of the things that is uh, a key talking point is that this is a regressive tax. This would be something that would affect people with incomes lower than $400,000, which is something that runs against the, uh, a main talking point that President Biden used on his campaign. Um, and it's something that we're emphasizing in discussions with both the administration and Congress. Um, finally, I, I would close with this. If you have not um, contributed even a, a small donation to our 60 uh, days, $60,000 in 60 days campaign that is going directly to our state advocacy efforts. Uh, we're putting great use to that and we appreciate it, appreciate anybody that has contributed thus far. Um, and uh, we hope to unveil new programming if we're able to do that. We are also doing an event here in Washington, D.C. in October. Uh, which we'll be releasing more details on, which is another fundraiser uh, for our advocacy efforts. Um, it is, uh, you know, a telling tale. Uh, and you look back September 9th uh, with, with the, the federal regulations uh, that could have been uh, if the lawsuit weren't, um, you know, successful, uh, that, that anniversary is coming right around the corner. So what better way to show your support uh, for your association dollars that were in play over the past few years. We still need to be active in that fight. Uh, still need to be active on all different fronts, local, state, and federal. Uh, so please uh, encourage your customers uh, and consumers to support the association in addition to any contribution from, from small to large. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, as always, you can reach out to Glenn and I directly, phone, email. Um, we'll keep folks apprised and issue out any alerts if anything major comes out. Um, but um, again, thank you very much for your attention and all that you do to protect and defend our right to enjoy premium cigars. Have a great afternoon.